Thank you, Mariam. It's a great privilege for me as the director of the European Parliament's liaison office in Washington, Washington uh, to inaugurate this panel of your very interesting seminar. Um, the European Parliament office is an office of connection. Uh, we were established here to connect the European Parliament and the members of the US Congress. Uh, but connection works at many levels and also at the level of connecting members of the parliament with, st with the student population uh, in the United States in, in terms of out, out, outreach. And I think for the subject you have today, you couldn't have a better guide than Mr. Austrovitsius, uh, who I actually first met when I was working with the president of the European Parliament and Petrus was the chief negotiator for Lithuania. So I think that was a very special role at a very special moment in our history um, where I think the lesson was that sovereignty shared is sovereignty gained. And I, I think Lithuania is, is a very, an excellent example of that. And um, so I'm very, very happy to have uh, connected you today. Um, I think my job is, is done for the moment and I'll hand over to the excellent moderator, uh, Ryan. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say hello on behalf of the European Parliament. Uh, thank you very much, um, Joseph, for your kind introduction. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. could also be good evening. Um, thank you very much for joining us today for the panel discussion on strengthening the Eastern Partnership. My name is Ryan Nabil, and I'll be uh, moderating this panel. Um, by way of introduction, I'm currently a Fox Fellow at Sciences Po, where I research Chinese diplomacy in Europe, and Chinese and Russian approaches to international organizations. Uh, prior to Sciences Po, I pursued an MA in Global Affairs at Yale University, and I worked um, as an economic policy researcher at the American Enterprise Institute, a think tank in Washington, DC. Now, before we begin, um, I would like to introduce to you the two speakers on our panel today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Ambassador, Ambassador Petras Ostrovichus, He's a Lithuanian politician, diplomat, and a member of the European Parliament. Ambassador Austrovichus started his distinguished career in politics and diplomacy as a senior specialist at Lithuania's newly established Minister of Foreign Affairs after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. At the age of 31, he became Lithuania's young ambassador to Finland, making him the youngest ambassador in Lithuania's history. Subsequently, Mr. Austrovichus served as a foreign policy advisor to the Lithuanian president, the chancellor of Lithuania, and the chief negotiator for Lithuania's accession to the EU. In his distinguished career, he also ran for presidential election in Lithuania and served as a lecturer at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University. In his current role as a member of the European Parliament, Mr. Astrovichus um, is, a, is a member of the EU Committee on Foreign Affairs. He's also extensively involved in the EU's relations with Belarus, Ukraine, and NATO. His familiarity with the highest levels of EU foreign policy making and his familiarity with Ukraine and Belarus means that we are especially privileged to have Ambassador Astrovichus in our panel today and hear his perspectives on the EU's Eastern partnerships. The second speaker on our panel is Mr. Richard Giragusian. He's the founding director of the Regional Studies Center, an independent think tank located in Yerevan, Armenia. He also serves as a visiting professor at the College of Europe and senior expert at Yerevan State University's Center for European Studies. He's also a contributing analyst for Al Jazeera and Oxford Analytica, a UK-based global analysis and advisory firm. Previously, Mr. Giragosian has served as a consultant for the Asian Development Bank, the EU delegation to Armenia, the International Crisis Group, the French Ministry of Defense, and the US, U.S. Departments of State and Defense, among many other organizations. Uh, Mr. Gregosian is a prolific writer, and he has written extensively for the European Council of Foreign Affairs, CSIS, and the Moscow Times. 
His articles have also appeared in many academic journals, including Oxford University's St. Anthony's International Review and the Harvard International Review. He has also been regularly quoted and cited by the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. We are very privileged to have Mr. Gurigosian on our panel today. Without further ado, I would now like to invite um, Mr. M Ambassador um, Ostrovichus to give us his brief remarks. Ambassador, please. Thank you so much. Thank you for a very kind uh, introduction and uh, many good words. I mean, you, uh, um, you followed I mean, your introduction, indeed. Um, I do recall uh, our meeting with uh, Pat Cox, uh, then uh, the president, the uh, chairman of, uh, of the European Parliament uh, in 2002, if I, if I am correct. Um, it was a good meeting, uh, Pat Cox, uh, since then, uh, he's not anymore a, a member of European Parliament, but uh, he is closely associated with the Eastern Partnership, I, I have to admit, and very well. Uh, he led uh, a special mission uh, what comes to supporting uh, Ukraine's capacity building uh, on the parliamentary level. So best regards uh, to Pat Cox, whom I meet uh, quite often and uh, interact uh, on uh, different, um, different issues and uh, enjoy every time meeting uh, Pat Cox. So uh, our uh, kind of uh, bilateral, uh, bilaterally well-built uh, relationship uh, uh, with your former uh, um, boss. Um, now on Eastern Partnership. You know, I mean, the, the history of Eastern Partnership, uh, just to make it uh, very brief, uh, to introduce you uh, how and when did it come. You know, after the Big Bang uh, enlargement, EU enlargement, uh, uh, the Big Bang wave uh, is called because uh, 10 uh, Central uh, and uh, Baltic countries uh, have joined the European Union in 2004. 10, all right? I mean, that's why it's big. And Bang was really was really, uh, you know, um, quite, uh, quite a loud one. Um, so the European Union then realized that uh, it needs a kind of the policy line towards neighborhood in the East. So that's why then the policy towards Eastern uh, kind of uh, neighborhood uh, started to emerge in the European Union. Nothing before. The European Union had uh, more, I would say, probably bilateral relations with many, many countries in, uh, in that region, but nothing of more, let's say, group-based uh, approach or strategy towards a group of countries. Uh, all right, it started. Then even Russia was among uh, those countries which was uh, seen as, as a neighborhood for the European Union. Um, but uh, later it changed its, uh, its profile since uh, with Russia it was uh, even a strategic partnership established, uh, which has died since then. But, uh, well, in 2009, two countries as Poland and Sweden, uh, having uh, uh, two uh, proactive uh, um, politicians, uh, then uh, one as a Foreign, uh, foreign ministers, uh, um, uh, Radek Sikorski, uh, Polish foreign minister, and Karl Bildt, the Swedish one, they have proposed to have something more, something more comprehensive policy line towards uh, Eastern, uh, uh, Eastern Europeans. And those Eastern Europeans uh, were selected as six countries. Russia was not a part of this, and Russia has never been a part of Eastern Partnership. Uh, we called uh, Russia a neighbor of our neighbors, or um, uh, sing singling it out, but uh, Russia was never a part of Eastern Partnership. Those countries in Eastern Partnership were as uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Belarus. All of them are very different, and uh, in, in spite of this, the European Union uh, made a good offer to have uh, a more comprehensive, uh, more um, even a kind of tailor-made uh, approach towards those countries, but uh, under the umbrella of Eastern Partnership as a strategy to, uh, to promote 
regional cooperation, as well as the European Union's uh, relations, uh, political economic relations with those countries. And that region is quite vast. I can tell you that Ukraine itself, as a single country, is uh, it's huge. It's the biggest uh, country in Europe. It's 40, more than 40 million. Uh, well, Moldova is a smaller one, uh, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan as well, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, all in all, I, if, uh, if I am correct, I mean, they make, uh, well, uh, uh, around maybe 70 or 80 million people, if you include Belarus. So, from then on, the negotiations have started with each and every um, Eastern, uh, Eastern neighborhood country, to reach an agreement, a kind of agreement. Some countries were more ambitious. Those were Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia in particular. And uh, start, uh, negotiations were not easy. It took some time um, because the political stability was always a missing uh, uh, link in, in those countries. And not just because of those countries, but uh, because a big neighbor uh, in the East uh, has played uh, very vigorously uh, in the domestic politics of those countries and never wanted, I mean, to have uh, those countries being more closer attached to the European Union. We will come later to this point. But the uh, events uh, starting from Maidan in, in, in Ukraine in uh, 2014, um, since in 2013, Ukraine has refused to sign the uh, association agreement. Uh, then uh, Lithuania was, in, uh, was a, a, in presidency, in council's presidency. And then Yanukovych, who then became a, a kind of uh, <laughs> um, an emigre um, who left uh, Ukraine and who is prosecuted by Ukraine's uh, uh, authorities since then, he refused because, I mean, he didn't see it uh, as uh, probably the right decision for Ukraine. But from 14 on, so the negotiations were um, uh, speeded up. And in 15, we already ratified the agreement uh, with uh, Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova. Those countries have reached association agreements. Association agreement is, um, is a kind of different uh, association agreements, I mean, the European Union had with, um, let's say, countries which, which have joined even in 2004. My country as well had the association agreement from 2000, and, uh, excuse me, from 1996. Then it was more kind of a roadmap uh, of uh, um, approximation uh, and so on. This type of association agreement with uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova is more advanced. I would say it's, it's not the pre-membership agreement, but rather making those countries ready for something more than a partner. But in those agreements, there is no promise that those countries will become one day or another uh, full-fledged members of the European Union. It was a frustration on, on those countries' side. Um, there are, uh, there are a couple of lines, by the way, in the agreements of uh, Ukraine and Georgia, which proclaims that those countries have uh, European aspirations. Aspirations. It's a very general uh, definition. Um, you might have uh, quite a, quite a uh, political fantasy, I mean, to, you know, I mean, to uh, translate it to, to the kind of pre-membership uh, um, status, but nevertheless, those agreements are with the political cooperation, economic cooperation, uh, and a, a legal approximation uh, um, with the quite a substantial part. And I have to admit that uh, already for seven years, uh, when the association agreements are in force, those countries in particular, Ukraine, Moldova, and, uh, and Georgia, um, made a, quite a progress. Generally speaking, uh, the Eastern Partnership, to my mind, is the most successful regional instrument of the European Union towards neighborhood. If you look, if you take a look to the southern neighborhoods, you will find nothing like this, nothing of this kind, 
Nothing of this partnership and cooperation framework as with the Eastern Partnership countries. And if you follow the advance and the progress those countries have achieved, you might judge that uh, it's a very successful. Generally speaking, Eastern Partnership is a success story, to my mind, although it is individualized uh, very much and depends on political will and situation in uh, those countries as well. But uh, I have to admit that um, uh, if you compare the state of play, the European Union, uh, uh, Union's relations with those countries before and after signing association agreements, it's, it's like a day and a night. Of course, I mean, those countries having more ambition, ambitions, uh, some of them are very loudly and repeatedly call for recognition of their status as future members of the European Union. But I have to admit that for the time of being, the European Union has no appetite at all for any speedy enlargement in itself. We just went through the Brexit. Uh, first time in the European history, European Union's history, I mean, the number of countries dropped by one, minus one. Now we're 27. And of course, I mean, even by, uh, you know, arithmetic uh, uh, kind of uh, way of thinking, uh, any organization which is not increasing, but decreasing, uh, is sending not the right probably message. So that's why for the time of being, the European Union is more based and focused on Western Balkans as a region for future enlargement. And with the Eastern Partnership, it is still uh, very comprehensive, uh, very dynamic cooperation uh, in, in many regards, but nothing said about the future membership. For the time of being, the European Union is busy with the next decade strategy for Eastern Partnership, because 10 years already have passed, I think they brought a lot of major ac accomplishments in this regard. I was a rapporteur on Eastern Partnership uh, Resolution in the European Parliament. Uh, my strategy for those countries, uh, generally speaking, I would uh, go for gradual integration, seeing uh, lots of, uh, you know, an ease on EU side to say yes for enlargement. So that's why, I mean, gradual integration to my mind would be first of all, based on uh, integration into the single market, because the single market of the European Union still remains the biggest, most advanced market in, in the world. I mean, we are still 450 and more. Uh, it's, it's a big, well advanced, uh, well-structured market, and for any country which takes part in a East in a single market, uh, um, you know, framework, it's a huge um, promotion for increasing competitiveness, for increasing trade, economic operation, investment uh, incentives, and so on and so forth. In political field, um, I have to admit uh, that we still didn't uh, find probably any new proposal for those countries. Uh, um, everything remains uh, open uh, for the time of being. But uh, the next summit of the Eastern Partnership will be in December this year under the Slovenian presidency. And uh, I don't expect any mir uh, miraculous things uh, to, uh, to happen uh, at that summit. I expect uh, probably more practical uh, proposals uh, or some... Uh, economy-based, investment ba investments-based, uh, some special economic uh, promotion programs uh, um, um, uh, designed for those countries. Maybe, maybe, and I hope it will, it will happen. The European Union will open up its two major initiatives. That's a green deal, all right, and digital market. If, if that happens, it's already something for those countries because it's a global phenomena and a global tendency. Those countries have to undergo transformations uh, um, of this kind, but uh, nothing spectacular on political level. So that's why I feel a lot of unease from those countries, as well as NATO membership, as we know. I mean, on 14th of June uh, will be NATO summit in Brussels and uh, Ukraine in particular, and probably followed by Georgia, 
they criticize uh, the NATO, um, uh, NATO organization for not being invited to the summit. To the summits of Eastern Partnership, all countries will be invited. But um, as I said, um, it will be a strategy for the next 10 years. Uh, many different things might happen. New challenges will emerge. Uh, the old ones will not probably vanish um, uh, as such. So we will see a, a new reality. But frankly, I'm optimistic seeing the progress those countries have achieved. The rest, three countries like Armenia, Azerbaijan, and in particular uh, Belarus, we will focus on that country later, uh, have different approaches. They chosen Armenia and Azerbaijan different types of agreements to be uh, to reach to be reached with the Euro European Union. Azerbaijan more focused on economic issues. Uh, Armenia much more on uh, political ones. But now the situation in, uh, in the region is a very uh, peculiar one. And I wonder to what extent uh, those agreements will be finalized. Uh, I'm looking forward for my great, uh, uh, great colleague, uh, uh, Grigory Siana, to, uh, to, to go forward and to explain his uh, strategy, uh, what comes to Armenian situation in particular. But I wish uh, those countries would have free hands to, you know, to build their destiny not being uh, under the impact of the Russian uh, policy, on which we, again, later will focus more. That's my initial statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now, uh, Mr. Girigosian, um, please, you have the floor. Well, it's always difficult to follow such a comprehensive, sweeping presentation, <laughs> but I do want to go into some points of agreement in terms of the Eastern Partnership what the policy represents, and what it offers. In a general sense, the Eastern Partnership is a comprehensive avenue of engagement, but it's also about civic empowerment, empowering ordinary citizens. And it's about education. Empowerment, education, and engagement are the driving factors in terms of the success of the Eastern Partnership. But I would also say, as a program, it is also a pivotal platform, a platform for engagement between the European Union and the six very different Eastern Partnership states. However, it's also equally significant as a platform between the six Eastern Partnership countries in terms of lessons learned, and the shared threats, if you will, in a very, very much in a region at risk. But more than that, it's about interconnectivity, which is more than a slogan or a concept, but a necessity and an imperative. And underlying the success of the Eastern Partnership was a modification, an adaptation in what became known as the policy of differentiation noting and recognizing the variations of needs and demands or expectations between the very different six Eastern Partnership countries. And I would also say the Eastern Partnership has been driven by a triad of strategic significance based on three unique specific drivers. The first driver is the most recent. I see the European Union in this context as a first responder in terms of a first response to the shared pandemic threat from COVID-19. And the EU is uniquely positioned to help support the economic recovery from COVID-19 and the necessity to rebuild and restore regional and global supply chains. This is going to be the pressing challenge, but it is the EU as the first responder in this coming crisis. The second driver of the success of the Eastern Partnership has been very much the European Union and its power of attraction. The European Union's values and ideals are seductive, are inspiring, and provide aspirations. In contrast, to be honest, 
Russian values and ideals are what? Corruption, coercion, pressure. This is not uh, equal or equitable in comparison to the value of European ideals. And what's important is for the Eastern Partnership, the attraction is based on much more than simply membership aspirations. In the Armenian context, we're practical and prudent, and unfortunately, we're not ready to aspire to EU membership at this point. Azerbaijan, similarly, is not interested. This is, however, a reflection and a recognition of the deeper, more broad level of attraction to the European Union, because it's based on values and vision strategic vision as much as values. And for the countries of the Eastern Partnership, let's be honest, we're on the front line of democracy, just as the Baltic states, each of the three Baltic states, were long known as captive nations. They too, as EU members, are pivotal bulwarks on the front line of democracy, just as the Eastern Partnership. But it's more than just democracy, it's development. And in this context, the European Union has a unique advantage. That advantage is the ability to harness youth as the agent of change. It is the youth and the demographic change that is most inspiring as they aspire to European values. And for example, in the South Caucasus, there are very few young students who are seeking to study in Smolensk or Vladivostok or Krasnodar compared to the appeal of the University of Tartu, Vilnius, the College of Europe. Moreover, the third driver of the success beyond EU's role as a first responder and beyond the power of attraction is the modification of a collective investment in a new policy between the European Union and the United States. It is the shift in policy from democracy promotion to democracy protection. This is very needed against the, the underlying threats of the rise of authoritarian governments, both within the European Union, if we look at Hungary, and recent developments in Poland and the Czech Republic, but also within the Eastern Partnership. Armenia has had a rare opportunity of a nonviolent, successful victory of people power in 2018. We are now preparing for a second free and fair election as a new precedent. But unfortunately, the threat and challenge from authoritarian states still remains. At the same time, the important thing is to invest in the institutions of democracy. As important as individual Democrats are, it's not enough. It's the institutions of democracy that are much more important to resilience than individual Democrats, if it's Saakashvili or anyone else. And in this context, there is a commitment and an investment in making a difference in the ordinary lives of ordinary citizens. This is where the Eastern Partnership comes in. And in conclusion, it's most important to say there is no conclusion. This is a dynamic, not static process. However, there are two observations. One is justified optimism, as my colleague Petras has noted. We're both justifiably optimistic. But at the same time, there's a degree of unwarranted modesty. The EU is far too modest for not recognizing the deep and lasting success of the Eastern Partnership. The second observation, to be honest, is the European Union is not to blame for all of our problems in the Eastern Partnership. But at the same time, the European Union is not the answer to all of our problems either. Shortcomings in democracy, deficiencies in governance. The EU is an important opportunity. It's a tool, but it's not the answer to all of our problems. 
It requires uh, self-sufficiency and political will that unfortunately has been an endangered species in much of the Eastern Partnership. And thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be with the sixth annual European Students Conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, for your very insightful comments and remarks. Um, now, in the next stage of our event, we're going to move to um, question and answers. I have a few questions that I'd like to ask uh, both of you. <clears throat> My first set of questions are about um, the second Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan last year. Uh, for our audience that might not be aware, uh, very briefly, um, Azerbaijan launched a military offense against Armenia. The resulting conflict resulted in Armenia returning to Azerbaijan most of the territories that Armenia had occupied in the early 1990s as a result of the previous conflict over the same region. A primary lesson from the conflict is that you know, the, the really it has shown us the importance of full spectrum air, air defense against drones and such. So this raises a set of questions that I'd like to ask you. First, what military lessons should the EU and individual European countries draw from this conflict to prepare against such future conflicts? Second, uh, what are some of the ways that the EU, what are some of the projects that the EU could undertake to improve economic integration between Armenia and Azerbaijan and also the rest of Europe? And to what extent should the EU pursue limited strategic cooperation with Turkey and Russia which have both been involved in this conflict uh, to promote peaceful relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I'd be very interested to hear your views on these questions. Can I go first, Ryan? Only because I'm closer to the situation. Uh, I understand your question in terms of the military implications, but I have a slightly different perspective. The main concern I have is consisting of several elements. And it's not the military operations of the war. It's the fact that the war actually happened. In other words, the more basic premise is a challenge to the European Union in terms of a dangerous precedent, where Azerbaijan, with Turkish military support, was able to show a dangerous military resolution to essentially a political diplomatic conflict. This is a very dangerous precedent if left unchallenged, a dangerous precedent for all other frozen conflicts. A related dangerous precedent here is the seeming victory of authoritarian Azerbaijan and authoritarian Turkey against an infant democracy in Armenia and in Nagorno-Karabakh. What this resulted in, to be quite honest, is Armenia is now ever more firmly within the Russian orbit. Russia, and only Russia, was the victor from this deadly war. What we need is a return to diplomacy in order to challenge the narrative of these dangerous precedents. But at the same time, what the EU is going to do is engagement in post-war stability. And that includes a range of toolbox measures from people-to-people -people contact, resumed track two diplomacy. In other words, we need to transform this military situation into a post-war opportunity for renewed diplomacy. And unfortunately, we have Russian peacekeepers now deployed. This used to be the only conflict without a Russian presence. That is over. But we are in uncharted political territory here. And in many ways, I'm much more confident about the resiliency and stability of the legitimacy of the democratically elected government of Armenia than I am of what this means for an authoritarian government in Azerbaijan. Having said that, the U.S. is re-engaging in this region, and the European Union has a unique role to play in post-war stability. Oh, may I follow? Ambassador? May I follow? In fact, um, this is a long-standing frozen conflict. 
having a history of uh, more than 30 years. Hostilities uh, didn't happen, didn't come uh, just yesterday. Um, there is a long history of non-confidence and in fact, uh, very high tensions. I don't believe uh, there is uh, any military solution in this regard, although the last uh, military you know, uh, operation or a war, second war, was indeed um, more military-led rather than uh, uh, rather than by any any means, uh, and because uh, Azerbaijan has invested so much, if I am correct, uh, the Az Azerbaijan's uh, defense budget is bigger than the budget of uh, Armenia, and Azerbaijan might uh, may allow itself uh, to have uh, so much of resources being spent on. Uh, military and defense uh, matters. But I don't think uh, the military solution will be the final one, which will bring uh, kind of stability into the, this part of South Caucasus. Uh, lessons. I completely uh, agree uh, with this uh, previous speaker. Uh, Russia is a big winner. And not just uh, militarily speaking, uh, finally so-called uh, peace keepers of, of Russia are in the region. Never before. And by the way, I see both sides, uh, Armenian and uh, uh, Azeris, not happy with this uh, kind of installation. Now, over the sudden, I mean, uh, uh, there is a third or maybe even the fourth uh, force in the region, which might have own uh, strategy and own uh, considerations for the region's future rather than, uh, you know, uh, legitimate uh, government uh, in uh, Yerevan or Baku might, uh, might want uh, uh, to have. So it's something what we shouldn't uh, forget. Uh, the role of Turkey is really is uh, something very special. You know, one of my friends, uh, he is a very <laughs> prominent observer, Andrei Pomenovsky, Poniatowski. He said, like, you know, uh, Azerbaijan de facto is a NATO member country. Hmm. Well, one might think that uh, it's, it's, it's not an um, um, empty idea, because uh, Azerbaijan is more and more interlinked with the uh, Turkish um, uh, military doctrine, defense, uh, political, uh, um, you know, setups, and so on. It, I mean, there is uh, a part of the truth in, in, in this uh, description of the situation. Where it will, will lead, we will see. The role of the European Union. I regret much that the European Union was just a passive observer for too long. We have a special representative assigned for South Caucasus, Toivo Kla. But uh, even him, I mean, uh, he did nothing, I mean, to, to stop this war because it, it, it probably was not in the powers of the European Union because we, we've been absent. The European Union is not a part of so-called men's group. I will remind you that, I mean, that group is made of uh, uh, British, uh, uh, US, and, uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, French, I guess, Russians as well. So, but there is no not European British, Union. Not British. The co no British. US, France, and Russia, not, Russia. not British. No, no British, correct, yes. So, I mean, but there is no role of, of, uh, for the European Union, I mean, to, uh, to be played uh, in the region. Recently, I noticed a uh, couple of very strong statements from, uh, from Washington, D.C., I mean, uh, uh, calling for peace uh, uh, and uh, settlement and confidence building and so on and so forth. I think this is, a, this is something on which uh, the European Union should, should work more uh, intensively. I, by the way, initiated a letter uh, from the European uh, Parliament, I mean, uh, uh, collected uh, signatures of uh, many colleagues of mine, asking the European Union to be uh, one of the initiators of this peace process. There is no peace agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan. There is a, an agreement to stop hostilities. That's it. But now we have to think probably absolutely about different framework of uh, future cooperation and uh, relationship of those uh, two countries, 
which I hope uh, will find uh, one or another way of uh, peaceful coexistence. Uh, I don't think uh, we, we can, you know, I mean, invest uh, lots of um, time, uh, money and, and ideas uh, into something which, again, will be not uh, sustainable uh, in, in the long run. Uh, I don't think uh, present situation is, is, uh, is something what uh, even uh, Mr. Pashinyan thought about uh, uh, once he came uh, to power in, in 18 after uh, those, uh, indeed, uh, first-time democratic changes. And uh, we wished so much, I mean, and it was a promise to fight corruption uh, to go for reforms and so on and so forth. It was something we, we didn't hear for so long. And you know, if, uh, if Armenia and Azerbaijan will not reach a long-lasting peace agreement, um, I see only one scenario, sorry to say, uh, which is uh, more doomy probably, that uh, will be more incre uh, increasing um, uh, influence of Russia. And, and it coincides very much with the um, very ambitious uh, uh, policy line of Mr. Putin. He wants to reinstate his dominance in a post-Soviet region. He openly, openly demands even a, a kind of privileged access. He speaks about red lines, and those red lines do not stop on the Russian border. <laughs> they are somewhere, I mean, more... Uh, 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 to be advanced in, in his hand, uh, uh, he had, uh, excuse me, because I mean, he wants uh, to have a grip and uh, control on many, many countries. And South Caucasus is one of them. Georgia is, is a bit, again, I mean, in, in a dif uh, difficult situation because of those frozen, um, uh, two frozen uh, uh, conflicts uh, caught uh, after 2008 in, in particular. But nevertheless, uh, I hope the European Union will pronounce its, its more comprehensive role in South Caucasus. Otherwise, it will be, you know, just again, lots of statements, uh, some, you know, sectorial, um, uh, small uh, uh, scale programs, but no major advance. And, you know, I, I myself am looking forward to see um, Armenian and uh, uh, Azeri's leadership talking to each other. Maybe through uh, negotiators, uh, through mediators, but uh, they have to talk. Otherwise, you know, the third part or parties will, uh, will draw uh, their uh, future scenarios for those countries. Sorry to say. And I regret very much, I mean, that hostilities still continue. And uh, the, this week we saw some events again uh, with the uh, uh, lethal uh, outcome Again, it brings a lot of uh, non-confidence, uh, you know, kind of outbursts in, 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 within these societies. I will ask my last question before we turn, uh, turn to the audience. And that has to do with the recent uh, developments in Belarus. I, I, I think we see a similar theme that we see with Armenia and Azerbaijan that, you know, the, um, the real winner from the recent developments appears to be Russia. So my question to you is, are the current sanctions or the EU restrictive measures um, against Belarus enough? Do they need to be expanded? And what can the EU do to raise the cost of Russian interference or a possible inter intervention in Belarus to prop up the Lukashenko government? What are your overall thoughts about the EU's engagement in Belarus? May I start now? Because, I mean, it's, it's a more, more close neighborhood. Uh, uh, to, to me uh, this time. Um, you know, we are having, uh, we're having a very complicated um, situation uh, with Belarus. Belarus was simply neglected. Belarus was not on the map of, of Europe for a couple of decades. It was in the hands of Lukashenko. And there have been uh, politicians and uh, um, political observers who really liked that situation. Belarus was somehow quiet, I mean, didn't uh, raise uh, any stakes, uh, all right, I mean, it was never democratic, um, people disappeared, opponents were killed, uh, uh, opposition oppressed, but, I mean, for Europe it was, you know, I mean, still uh, kind of uh, status quo, which uh, didn't demand too much of a attention and time and resources uh, to be spent on Belarus. Things have changed. 
And now we, I, I see three challenges. Political one, um, ordinary Bel uh, Belarusians do not want I mean, to be back uh, uh, to the point they've been before. They realize that, look, uh, um, they've been fooled around for too long, too much, and dictator is really um, becoming more and more brutal. The, for the time of being, there are more than 450 political prisoners, 450. When I hear these stories from my personal friends who've been thrown, uh, thrown, thrown to the uh, prisons and now simply, you know, close to, uh, to death because of bad conditions, uh, uh, you know, disease and, and so, uh, negligence and so on and so forth, simple thing, which I know, I mean, uh, uh, by heart, you know, uh, the cell for four people is filled with 16. Four beds, 16 people. Absolutely, no showers, no drugs, no any, you know, human attitude. I mean, no uh, uh, um, medical assistance whatsoever. I mean, people are getting infections, COVID, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's disaster. But the nation, Belarusian nation, realized enough is enough. Second, economic issue. Belarus is going down, really down. Um, the average salary decreases every month after month. Um, well, uh, uh, Putin gives some credits, uh, but it's not enough uh, for Belarus to survive economically. And the third uh, uh, aspect is this so-called uh, agreement with Russia about the unification or establishing a union state, which is again, I mean, it's, come on, it's, uh, it's another form of occupation. I mean, let's be frank. Uh, at that time, at 99, Lukashenko was in fact uh, leading this uh, uh, negotiations because he had a crazy idea to be uh, president of uh, um, uh, Belarus and, and, and Russia. He saw an opportunity because Yeltsin was, you know, drinking too much. I mean, he was weak, uh, not influential. And he had, he was, uh, Lukashenko was, by the way, far uh, uh, most popular figure in, uh, in, in Russia. But now things have changed. Now Putin is, Putin is in charge. <laughs> and Putin decides everything what will happen next. So that's why we, we are looking forward to, uh, to save, uh, you know, sovereignty of this country. Otherwise, uh, will be just one more uh, attempt uh, of uh, of uh, of Russia to extend its borders and to swallow the Belarus. Sanctions, come on! For the time of being, uh, um, we have uh, the we had the third package of sanctions: eighty-eight persons, seven entities under sanctions. It's uh, it's it's a joke. We need uh, sectorial sanctions, economic sanctions. Uh, I don't know to what extent uh, Belarusians are ready, but I feel that uh, they have changed their opinion and they are ready to uh, more sacrifice in order to speed up some uh, developments. Let me follow up on that just a little bit more. I would say on the one hand, the challenge of Belarus, of dealing with the Lukashenko regime, exposes the limited leverage we have in the West in terms of the leverage is too indirect and too long-term compared to Putin's leverage. What's interesting, however, though, Petros made a very good point. For years of status quo, that was equated with a false security. Real stability and security is not derived from status quo that was Belarus. And I do think there was a degree of benign neglect by the West of the situation. Having said that, I think the key to the future of Belarus is in terms of isolation. And I am a little more optimistic that there's perhaps less the West can do or the EU, but the isolation is being determined and driven by a miscalculation by Minsk and Moscow. In other words, the Russian position is actually weaker. It's based on weakness, not strength. If we look at Ukraine, for example, Putin perhaps gained Crimea, but he lost Ukraine forever. 
Putin at the same time has gained Lukashenko, but has lost the Bel Belarusian people. What this means is isolation, where the situation in Belarus is increasingly unsustainable and in many ways is too much of a cost for Putin to continue to support in terms of the cost-benefit analysis. And if we look at the most egregious, the most flagrant violation was the hijacking of the airliner from Athens to Vilnius and what happened on board. What this shows is a test of, of European resolve and commitment. And Putin, like Lukashenko, is very good at testing and probing Western unity and response. And when it's weak, they proceed. However, I do think the European reaction and the airspace issue has tended to raise the stakes and increase the isolation. But again, I think the real future is in the hands of the ordinary citizens of Belarus who are past the tipping point. And it may quickly become Ceausescu in Romania in terms of also unpredictable outcome. If Lukashenko is forced out, there's also a danger of his own security forces posing a new challenge with not necessarily a better regime. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running a little um, low on time, but we do have quite a few interesting questions posed by the audience, so uh, perhaps we can try to answer one or two of them very briefly. So the first question that I think is especially interesting uh, by uh, Mr. Justin Tomzik, um, he is asking, should the EU move away from being an exclusively normative power? In other words, what would, quote, intervention or, quote, influence by Brussels is, is in the Eastern Partnership should look like? And if I m might add, um, which of these two models of EU leadership strikes you as desirable? Hey, uh, well, basically, the European Union is a normative power, indeed. And uh, for the time of being, I mean, uh, we shouldn't... Uh, be optimistic about uh, European Union changing uh, too quickly. We are having for the time uh, this future conference, but again, I, I doubt uh, the future conference will produce any major, major results uh, which might uh, change the policy line and uh, set of instruments the European Union uh, in, is in process. Uh, there is a kind of uh, paradox. You know, the European Union is asking the Eastern Partnership countries to, to do reforms, uh, to, uh, um, you know, to change their uh, legislation and so on and so forth. But in most cases, what is needed in those countries is security. And not just economic security, but military security as well. Look at Ukraine, okay, Georgia. Um, I think uh, something uh, similar um, in, might happen with, uh, with Moldova, I'm afraid. And even now, I mean, well, there is a frozen conflict in Moldova, let, let's be frank. So that's why the European Union should enlarge its instrumentarium in cooperation and partnerships uh, with uh, Eastern Partnership countries. I, I sense a certain change in the air since... Uh, we got uh, this East, uh, European peace facility, a new instrument. Never before the European Union was, uh, uh, was able to provide security and defense uh, uh, stuff to, uh, to, to countries uh, under development assistance. Now we can. And let's see what we can do with the security and defense missions in, in those countries. This is something what those countries need a lot. Let me just add two points. First, I would argue, as an American who lives in the region, as important as normative power is, I also give credit to the Europeans for transformative power. And what I'm talking about is, for the EU and the Eastern Partnership, the view on the ground, looking to Brussels, is the offer and opportunity of innovation, entrepreneurship, the future of 
globalized economic and trade relations, and the right kind of job creation. In contrast to Russia, in other words, there is innovation entrepreneurship in Russia is punished, not rewarded. So I do think the Europeans have more of an advantage in the transformative power. At the same time, I think the broader framework of this very conference, the transatlantic alliance, will also play a much larger role in the contribution in a new way. The announcement recently from the Biden administration in Washington, elevating corruption as a national security consideration and threat, coupled with the protection of democracy and a pushback against authoritarianism. I think this element of the transatlantic alliance will address the weaker areas of European or EU insecurity. In other words, the lack of real hard power. But again, I'm justifiable in my optimism, but I'm also have to be optimistic living in Armenia and the Eastern Partnership. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we will have the last question, and there's a question by Gabriel Beauvalet Boche, and that is for Ambassador Ostrovitches. How does Lithuania seize its place? in the trimarium right now? Well, I think we are on a, on a, on a front line and uh, we do feel uh, a lot of things uh, which are, which are uh, you know, happening in, in Belarus. First of all, we, we received indeed uh, a big, big group of uh, refugees, political refugees uh, from, from Belarus. Uh, secondly, what we're facing now is something what we didn't see, I don't know, I mean, for decades, probably. You know what, what is going on? Uh, illegal refugees, what uh, Lukashenko, by the way, promised uh, to let them go to, to the West, as he said. Oh, you, you don't want, I mean, to cooperate with me? Then I will keep my borders open. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the last, uh, I don't know, four or five days, uh, we saw uh, quite a surge of uh, refugees coming through the Belarusian border. And they are not Belarusians. They are Syrians, Iraqis, uh, Russians, uh, Central Asia. And uh, we see, I mean, no you know, will of uh, cooperation from, from the uh, Belarusian uh, border, uh, border guards at all. In opposite, I mean, they push them uh, to, uh, um, to the site of, of Lithuania and try to, you know, to uh, uh, delete any, any marks uh, um, as, as they crossed uh, uh, this uh, border, uh, uh, border region, um, uh, generally speaking. And thirdly, we see a lot of increase of, uh, of smuggling, of tobacco products, because regime needs money, <laughs> and especially cash. So that's why we, we're facing absolutely new reality. And I believe we have to be ready for something else. What else? I, I wish I, uh, I were more optimistic, but I think we, we should be ready for more provocations from the uh, Lukashenko side. I am very serious about this. Um, th thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your answer. And with that, that brings us to the close of this panel. I want to thank, I want to thank Ambassador, I want to thank uh, Mr. Gregosian, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Dunn for your very kind remarks and your thoughts. It has been a very interesting discussion. And I also want to thank Mariam for her excellent role in organizing this panel. And I want to, most importantly, I want to thank the audience for attending this event. So with that, I'll hand over it to Mariam, if you have any more logistical details. Um, yes, on my end, I would also like to thank our panelists, Mr. Gergosian, Ambassador Osrovichus, Mr. Joseph Dunn for opening our panel, and of course, um, Ryan for doing an excellent job moderating. Thank you so much for your time and patience. Um, and thank you to our attendees for staying with us, for asking amazing questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, and I wish this was, a, it was longer in order for us to answer all the really interesting questions. 
Um, I won't keep anyone else longer. I know we have more events to follow. Um, so I wish everyone a great day. Um, and thank you all.